Hi, listeners. Welcome to Grief Out Loud. Remember the last time you tried to talk about grief and suddenly everybody left the room? Grief Out Loud is opening up this often avoided conversation because grief is hard enough without having to go through it alone. We bring you a mix of personal stories, tips for supporting children, teens, and yourself, and interviews with professionals in the grief world. Platitude and cliche-free, we promise. Grief Out Loud is hosted by me, Jana DeCristofero, and produced by Dougie Center, the National Grief Center for Children and Families in Portland, Oregon. This was meant to be a story about grieving in a foreign land, of being British, but living in France when your fiancé dies, leaving you with two young children, a story of navigating the logistics of cancer treatment and funeral planning, all in a different language. In the end, it is a story about that, but it's also the story of the accumulation of loss in a very short period of time. Rebecca's mother died of cancer in 2013. Her fiancé was killed in a car crash less than a year later in 2014. Between then and now, she's also had a number of family members and friends die, and she's gotten married and had a third child. In other words, she's been living life as many of us do, with joy and grief existing alongside each other. But in talking with Rebecca, you'd think she was decades older, given just how much loss she's experienced. A few notes. Well, maybe just one big one. We were recording internationally, as Rebecca still lives in France, and the recording platform was having a bit of a temper tantrum. So there are a few spots where the sound gets a little wonky. Okay, here's our conversation. Rebecca, thank you for making our um, international time zone challenge work uh, to join me today for Grief Out Loud. I'm looking forward to talking with you. Thank you very much. So have I. Really been looking forward to it. And Rebecca, you first reached out to me, you know, just to thank me for the podcast and shared that your mom had died, that your fiance had died back in 2013 and 14. But in talking with you, it seems like you are just really surrounded by a lot of grief and loss these days. And I wondered if you wanted to share about some of the other people in your life who have died as well. Yeah. Like you said, the the first people that I lost was when I was uh, 20, uh, 22, when I lost my mom in 2013. And then my fiance, just over a year later, we had um, a little bit of a break from from losing people for a few years. And then just before the pandemic, I lost my granddad and my great uncle. Then after that, it unfortunately has now gone back to losing younger people. We've had uh, one of our guys from our friend group. He died in his sleep. Uh, he was only 34. Um, he was one of my fiance's best friends. He was a lovely guy and uh, he really took it hard when uh, my fiance passed away and he was never quite the same after that. And, uh, but you know, another, he was such a, a loud guy, like center of attention and, and he's left a big space. The reason why I found your podcast was um, on the 19th of June, unfortunately, I've lost uh, two friends in a car accident it was a um, head-on collision with another vehicle and it's come out recently that the other person was under the influence and that's what caused the crash and you know my friends were 25 and 30 and they hadn't they were gonna they were talking about having kids and they were going away soon and again just most lovely of people that are gone now and it just every single time that something happens I think well that's it now nothing else can happen, can it? (laughs) And uh, it's, you know, like them loyalty cards that you get in shops. That's what I kind of (laughs) feel like I'm doing, but with grief. Um, We've had some friends that have lost their baby, my cousin. It's hard to stay happy sometimes when uh, when things like this keep happening. I mean, I do, I've got three children and uh, I am now married as well, but um, I really felt heavy, like your heart was broken and your chest really felt like someone was pushing on it. Um, So I really get why people say it's heartbreaking and someone's heartbroken because it really feels it's in that area. It feels like um, someone's pulling it out of your chest. (laughs) Yeah, I don't really know how to finish that off. But yeah, it's just a timeline of grief and losing people. And you try not to make life about just about that. There are lots of good things in life but um 
it's get it got me quite got me down and that's when that's when I found your podcast and it really helped me listening to you and then other people's stories as well well and I wonder Rebecca too so many of the people in your life who have died died you know this idea of out of order which Megan Devine from Refuge and Grief talks a lot about these out of order deaths of we have this expectation that people who are older than us will die but people younger than us are not going to die before we die young people aren't going to die babies aren't going to die and I you know how has that changed your perspective on life or how you live your life I mean at the beginning of your podcast you do say no cliches but really I kind of live every day as it comes I have to take every day as it is and try and live live for the moment really try not to let it get get us down because there's so much good in life as well and there's like I mentioned I've got three children from the age of I've got 11 year old an eight year old and a two year old so I've got to be happy and live for them and just because yeah we've had a lot of grief it doesn't mean that that's what we have to live every day just try and just try and do things for them and move on to happier times while we can on those days and then feel sad when we need to feel sad it's an up and down and being surrounded by so many people who are quite young when they die you were also very young and it's a time in life where grief and death aren't like the expected topics of conversation when you're hanging out with your friends in your early 20s and how was it for you with your social connections being so young and carrying so much grief I mean um you realize who your friends are you I had I I was lucky that I do have a, a lot of good well I've got enough good friends that were there and that are still there for me um when I needed it yeah, it did. It did change the subject of conversation. Like you say, you go from talking about, oh, how drunk was this person the other day to remembering things that people that we've lost now have, you know, reminiscing and uh, just talking about, you talk about death quite a lot. We don't as much now. We try and, well, the conversation just leaves you well, leads you elsewhere, but um, it changes a whole friend group. It doesn't just change the person that's lost. It does change the whole, the, everything that you do together, really. We did a lot more things as a family in a way. Um, we'd go away for weekends together. Just do a, almost like a, like what you do with a family rather than just hanging out with friends and having fun all the time. Speaking of family, when your fiancé died, the two of you had two children together who were really young, two years old and four weeks. And... So here you are also suddenly a solo parent and wondering what that experience was like. Well, I think going from one to two children is very hard anyway, um, minus the grief. And then suddenly finding myself alone with two children, even though I did, like I said, I did have a good support group around me. It was very, very hard. But the amount of love that I have for the kids got well just uh, I just concentrated on them and doing things with them um my fiance's parents who are called Mark and Sue they uh, I'm really close with them we have a really really good relationship obviously they love seeing their grandchildren they they live in France as well with um, not far away from where I live that brought us closer together I mean we're close anyway but it brought us closer together because we've been through trauma together now and they've lost their son and he was an only child. They were a big support for me. I went to live with them for a few months. So they helped me get through the first bit. And then my dad, um, my dad uh, lived closer at the time as well. So he was there. So a lot of people stepped in to help. Yeah, I was lucky in in that I did have a lot of people that were there because I think it's because um, my fiance was such a nice, you know, he was a nice guy always happy. So he attracted those types of people, those types of friends. I'm quite a positive person as well. So it was just um, the right type of people around us. And it just helped get me out of a darker place. And for your kids, as they've grown older, what have they needed from you in their grief? Or what have they just needed in their grief about their dad? 
Um, it's more as they've grown. My daughter, my eldest, um, Caitlin, was not even, I think she was nearly three when um, when her dad died. And um, so at first she didn't understand. When you're three, they, she was only just starting to talk a lot more and everything. And it was the explaining the, the fact that death is permanent. Like when my mum died, she was really tiny. She was, uh, yeah, nearly two. So she, you don't really understand at that point at all. And then the year after with, with um, losing her dad, it's, it, they just don't really have any concept of time. And it was more, I'd explain that, um, you know, that, that daddy had gone and, and everything. And then they'd forget, she'd forget about it for weeks and then be like, oh, where's dad? just kind of dropped that in the conversation and it, it kind of shocked me every time and I used to try and um not cry well you know not just burst into tears every single time that he uh, that she mentioned him and then that, that just went forwards and back for a few years and then as she when, as she got older when she got to about five or six um she just non-stop questions about her dad because she was old enough then to understand what a little bit more what had happened she had all these questions that I just wasn't ready for um but she she does have a few memories with him and we try and talk about those memories often so that they don't get lost it's just little memories um of him um of her playing with her dad but my um my little boy who was four weeks old at the time he obviously doesn't remember his dad and we don't even have that many pictures because he was only four weeks old uh, we've got a lot of pictures of him, but not really with his dad. He, um, my son had a, um, a difficult time a few years ago, again, when he was about five or six, when he was uh, understanding what had actually happened in, in, in a way that he could express his feelings about it more. And again, with all the same type of questions, like, um, but when's he come? But a lot of it was, are you sure they're not coming back? And that was hard to get across to the kids Uh, and I went for a little bit of counselling and bought some books and we had a look at those together uh, to help explain to kids in a way that a kid can understand because I was having trouble understanding it myself so it was hard to explain to a child what had happened. It can be so painful for the adults when those kids when kids do hit that age of trying to make sense of like but when someone dies that means they don't ever come back and so then they ask the same questions over and over again and I feel like they just reflect back to us as adults the same disbelief we carry in some part of ourselves even though we get it like we know when someone dies they don't come back but there's still a part of us that's like but what just happened you know the the surreal nature of it and I feel like the kids just reflect that and kind of poke at it for us Um, it can be really painful as adults. Yeah, and when they're really little, they're just so, like, blase about everything. Like, they'll just come out to it. I mean, um, a few times my uh, my eldest just came out randomly with it. We went to we went somewhere, and there was a kid there, and she just basically went up to him and said, Hi, my name's Caitlin, and my dad's dead. It was um, <laughs> very, oh, God. And then the kid was like, oh, that's fine. My, mine's alive, or something like that. It was really, they were fine with it, but all the adults were like, oh. <gasps> you know we all froze and that they were absolutely fine at that age I mean three and four they everything's just so oh okay then to a child yeah (laughs) I sometimes envy people being that you know kids that age being able to talk so matter-of-factly about things as a way as an adult it's like oh how do I bring this up when do I bring it up how are gonna people react and they're just like my dad's dead how old's your dad yeah and they are uh they're much more accepting of one another I think because they haven't been socialized into the reality for so many of us, which is that people freak out and don't know how to respond if we bring up the fact that someone has died or bring up, you know, bring up our grief or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the awkwardness comes with age. (laughs) (laughs) Lucky us. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) They always told us we would grow out of the awkwardness, but some of the things that we deal with as adults, I feel like we just grow more into the awkwardness about it. Absolutely. (laughs) So the other unique aspect of your situation Rebecca is that you are from the UK and you are living in France still living in France when your mom died and when your fiance died and I wanted to talk a little bit more about what that part of your 
situation has been like to be, you know, I think you use the word a foreigner yeah. in, a, in, a, in a country that's not your home country when you're navigating not only the emotional part of grief, but just the logistics of grief too. And when someone dies, all the things that need to be done. Yeah. I mean, I think it would affect, affect families more when someone died here and they want to have the body sent back to the UK. That would be a whole different thing. I mean, I don't have um, experience with that. In France, I don't know how it is in America, but in, in the UK, if someone dies, it's quite a few weeks usually until the funeral. I don't know whether it's just because that's the delay. I think that's why it can be about three weeks. Um, so so for logistics for family to get over like if, if I needed to get back to England for a funeral I have a few weeks to play with that I can kind of try and organize myself whereas in France it's maximum seven days or three three to five days is the norm um, after someone's died for when until the funeral can happen and you can't legally go over that Oh, it's a law that it has to happen within three to five days. Yeah, exactly. When it was my mum, she died in that she had, um, she got cancer and, and died uh, in hospital. It was an illness um, about a year and a half. Um, and she wasn't even, when she got diagnosed, she wasn't even 50 yet. She was still quite young. When it's in a hospital, it's like a different procedure. You have to go to a certain, uh, yeah, like a certain funeral home in, in the town where we she passed away just it was very I speak French I'd say I speak fluent French so this made it easier but still I didn't know the word for coffin it's I only know French I learned I moved over to France when I was 14 and just had to go straight into school and learn in the like a normal French school and just sit in class and try and learn French at the same time you know, so it was quite, it was quite hard. Um, there were other English um, speaking students at the same school and we all had to do the same thing. So, but day-to-day -day conversation is what I, how I learned French. You don't really talk about coffins very often in day-to-day -day conversation. Like the word for tombstone, um, burial or cremation, it's all words that I didn't really, I didn't even know the word for it. I mean, there's some words like cremation is very similar in French. It's just basically the same word, but with a French accent. So when I was speaking to the guy and translating what my dad said, and he said, oh, we need to pick out the cercueil. And I'm like, what is that? What is he talking about? And uh, so then he took me into a room with all the coffins and I wasn't ready for that. Um, that, that was a hard thing to me. It was the, even though I did speak, I was used to being able to say anything that I wanted. And I suddenly, with the grief kind of slowing me down because you're trying to speak between sobs and I'm trying to think what you want to say. And then I'm trying to say what the word is. I'm like, oh, this is the word in English. And the guy, obviously, he doesn't speak English. <laughs> My mum didn't speak French very well. Um, she always got by with a smile and a, you know, a bonjour and you know, she she tried her best, but she, she wasn't very good at speaking French. Bless her. But when she was um, when she uh, was diagnosed with cancer, I um, I was 20, one, 21. And uh, it was not long after my eldest was born. So I was on maternity leave and I had to go. Well, I went with my mum to all of the appointments and I had to translate everything. So. I had to tell my mum that she had cancer. I had to tell my mum that her hair was going to fall out. I mean, I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. I'd rather it have been me telling all of this. And then when the cancer came back, I had to say, well, it's here, here and here. It, I didn't let it bother me while she was still here. But after I lost her, every, the grief of all of that, the grief of having to tell my mum all of that kind of all came out at the same time. While it was happening, I could just put everything in a box and in my brain and, and put it away. I knew that she wasn't going to get better, whereas my dad was, bless him, was um, more in denial about it. Yeah, when she did pass away, it was then that I could start grieving all of that from the beginning till the end, because it was, um, well, it was awful. It was, a, you know, it was a pretty traumatic from start to finish. I was struck, Rebecca, when you were talking about talking and how that was like 
one of the main ways of noticing like the challenge of being in a different country, navigating this grief, and that you had to be the person to use your words when your mom was sick with cancer. And then when your fiance died, the not being able to access the words was really painful. And so I was just thinking about both of those aspects of having the person with the words and being the person not able to find the words. And I wondered if there are other elements, I know you moved from the UK when you were 14, but if you have any sense of like, culturally, how does grief look different, feel different for folks living in the UK and then people living in France? I can only really speak about my family personally. I don't really, um, I'm in France, I mean, not necessarily with my mum and, um, and my fiance, but other funerals I've been to, uh, France are a little bit more in the, have your funeral in a church and it's a little bit more religious. And, um, well, I know that that's, um, that's a personal choice, uh, no matter where you live. The funerals in France seem to be dragged out a lot more my family if they're going to listen to this they would be like oh no Becky but um, if my uh, my family tend to go to the pub after a funeral or they, they have a few drinks and try and celebrate the life of the person that's just been lost and usually uh, you know unfortunately um, with everyone having their own lives when you know when there's a funeral we're kind of all shoved back together again and it's well, we're a very loud, happy family when we're all together. And the minute we are all together, it's as if no one's left. So we try and just uh, be as happy as possible, as quick as possible, but without forcing it, you know, we can, it's just more, uh, I don't know, like a celebration of life after someone dies. But then, I don't know, if you want to go around to, uh, come around to my house and we'll have a cup of tea and a cry, it's a bit more like that, like around a cup of tea in the UK, very, very <laughs> cliche. Um, <laughs> but um, in, in France, it's, um, well, again, um, the friends are, and everything, we're all there together. And it's, I suppose in my example, they're pretty similar on both sides because uh, my French friends you know, they invited me around all the time, make sure that I wasn't on my own. At first, I think they came and stayed with me. It's quite blurry, to be fair. Uh, I think they came and stayed with me and stuff. But no matter where you are, the awkwardness a little bit around grief is is international. We're all uh, still a little bit. No matter um, in the UK and then in France, I've had people say th- things to me and I think, oh, uh, like the typical that oh yeah my dog's died I know how you feel and no matter where you go there's always the people that are very clumsy with their words but um, there's not a huge huge difference I don't think between the UK and France the France uh, and France you tend to drink wine a little bit more and in the UK you tend to drink beer that's just about the, <laughs> the, di- the biggest difference um, um, but no I think I think round about the same thing would probably happen if I lived in the UK. On my personal experience is because of how the way that my friends are here and, and my family are in the UK. I think the only thing is we tend to hug a little bit more in the UK. It's a little bit more huggy, whereas in France they tend to do the kiss hello thing, the little bisou thing, the Euro kiss, which uh, <laughs> because of COVID is practically disappeared. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but um, no, I think there's not a huge, huge difference, I don't think. Like I say, it's more the funerals. The funerals are different. If it's a Catholic funeral in, in France, it lasts hours. You're there for th- two, three hours, whereas uh, in the UK, I think it's a, a little bit shorter. And Rebecca, you mentioned like the intense physicality of your grief, especially early on, where it felt like your heart was just getting smashed to pieces. And with you know the grief around your your mom and your fiance being almost 10 years out in a a year or two just wondering how is grief feeling for you these days day to day been okay I I kind of have my little moments that I need to just go out and do something I'll go and visit um places where my mum liked to go or I'll there's lots of things that I tend to do or say that actually my mum used to say to me and I'll say into my children and that kind of it'll automatically come out I'll say something and I think oh my mum used to say that to me and it give me a smile and I'm more in the I smile when I think about them now rather than cry as much even though there are those days where 
you do shed a tear and um, you just think it, about the how much space they filled, not with not physically, but the love and um, how much they were there in your life. And when I come, when I think about um, cause my my mum only met my firstborn, she would have. Uh, I mean, she was the doting grandma, absolutely adored Caitlin, my eldest. And you just think, oh, it's such a shame that she never got to meet my little boy. And then now I've got a little girl with my um with my husband. It's it's that that still gets to me. The what they're missing out on. It's weird because now I've, I have I am married and I now have Rose, my youngest. That wouldn't have happened. <laughs> you know, it's um, I find myself when I can't sleep at night just thinking about things like that. It just goes round and round in your head, and you just think, wow, you know, if something so tragic didn't happen, what I have today wouldn't be what I have today. But if that didn't happen, I'd be on the wiser. <laughs> so. It's just uh, I, I end up confusing myself for hours in uh, in uh, at night. I think um, me losing our friends a few weeks ago has kind of really opened up old, old wounds with me. I think there was quite a lot of grief that I haven't processed properly, actually, um, or whether it's just because certain things you feel. Now I'm in my thirties. That when you're in your twenties, you just don't feel you don't you don't think about. So I'm going back to therapy to uh, to help me through it. It's not as raw as the beginning, but it doesn't mean that you're forgetting forgetting the people that you've lost. You just kind of try and make them a part of you and move on with them rather than, even though you are leaving them behind at the same time. Yeah, I was trying to think of the word. It's like the only word that comes to mind is it gets a little more muted over time, but I don't think that's the the right word it makes me think maybe more of like if you have a rock that gets cracked in two and the edges are really rough and sharp and they catch you every time and then over the course of days and weeks and months they get a little worn down so the ridges are still there they're just not quite as piercingly sharp yeah that's how yeah that's sometimes how I think of it but then there are those days where maybe you drop the rock and a little piece of it gets broken off and it's just as rough and sharp as it was the first day yeah that's that's exactly right I think that's a really good way of looking at it that's how it that's how it feels yeah yeah but I just try and keep their merry memories alive as well and the thing that we things that we do and just keep them alive in the stories that we tell about them I mean it's not obviously it's not every day but I just try and keep part of them I mean my son looks He's the double of his fiance. He looks very, very much like him. Um, it's nice that sometimes when he looks at me, I was like, wow, gosh, you look like your dad <laughs> so much. <laughs> um, my eldest has his smile, which is good because he had really good teeth. <laughs> Even though he was from the UK, <laughs> we don't all have bad teeth. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, they're... Um, to be honest, they're really good kids. And uh, when when I was on my own, I, there was times, especially with the second born. I mean, usually the second born's the uh, the one that really keep one that really keeps you on your toes. And that was the the case with us. But he's kind of calmed down now. He's a lot more um, grounded, <laughs> and now he's older. Um, uh, they adore their little sister. I mean, she's a little monkey, and uh, they they just uh, adore her so much, which is really really nice I was you know it was all the whole how are they going to be now that we're you know when I met my now husband it was a whole how how is this going to work out how are the kids going to be with the new husband how's the new well how's the new boyfriend at first Uh, how's he gonna I mean he knew my story straight away you know it's the whole you don't know until you try at the minute we're we're all pretty um happy and living our little lives at the minute like I say I just moved you know, I'm um, with a with a rock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, and what from what you've shared, Rebecca, you have a whole pile of gravel with you right now, with so many stories of loss in the in the recent years. And I'm feeling grateful right now for you reaching out, you know, across the ocean, across the country to connect with me, 
to share your story, to offer a little bit of insight into what it's like to be, you know, grieving in a country that's not your home country, to be carrying so much loss at such a, such a young age, and to be parenting kids through all of it. So thank you for reaching out to me, and thank you for being willing to be on Grief Out Loud today. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I hope um, it kind of all made sense that I didn't go <laughs> off track too much. <laughs> I tend to babble grief. when I'm nervous, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, as we, always, as we all know, grief is totally not linear, and neither is our recounting of our experiences with grief. But thank you again, Rebecca. I appreciate your time today. And listeners out there, I say it each and every time, but thank you for being part of the show, for sharing episodes with people who you think might be supported by the conversations that we're hearing. If you want to reach out to me, as Rebecca did, you can email me at griefoutloud at dougie.org. That's D-O-U-G-Y dot O-R-G, which is also our website where you can find information about our local peer grief support group programming, as well as all of our free downloadable resources like tip sheets and activity sheets and every past episode of Grief Out Loud. And I'm also excited to share with you that this podcast is sponsored in part by the Chester Stephan Endowment Fund. So thanks again for listening, and we hope you'll join us again next time.